Today, we are going to talk to Pierre Timms, who's going to share how you can go from being a barista in Paris to being a CEO in Stockholm in just five years. Welcome to Café Sverige and Café med Fredrik. Today we are going to talk to Pierre Timms. Pierre is the founder of Stockholm Coffee Festival and is currently working as the CEO at Espresso Specialisten in Stockholm, Sweden. Today we're going to have the interview in English because Pierre is from Australia, so it's easier for him to speak in English. So I'm going to give it my best as well. Uh, welcome to Café Sverige, Pierre. Thank you for having me. Excited to be the first English English guest, I guess. Yeah, it's going to be uh, really nice to talk to you about some coffee. I understand that you have a cup with you today? Yeah, I do. I have my cup right in front of me. Um, I'm drinking some coffee from a new roastery in Stockholm called Volta Coffee. Um, they're a little cafe and, well, coffee roastery. And they do, you know, fantastic, you know, small batch roasting. So I'm drinking an Ethiopian coffee. So it's very light, very clean. My favorite type of coffee. Uh, it sounds really nice. Uh, today I'm having a coffee from Coffea Circular. Uh, it's a Kenyan coffee with a, a lot of flavor notes of apple, blueberry, and mango. So it's really nice as well. Wow. Super nice. Who are Pierre Timms? <laughs> so I'm Pierre. I originally come from Australia, um, so if I have an accent, then you know where it's from. I've been working in the coffee industry for 10 years now, been very lucky to work all over the world. So I've worked in Australia, Melbourne, in Paris, in Switzerland, and now I'm working in Sweden. So I've been in Sweden for five years. I was the head barista at Café Pascal in Udenplan when I first moved to Sweden, and then as you mentioned, Frederick founded the Stockholm Coffee Festival uh, in 2018. I ran my own business in coffee between 2019 and 2020. And then of course, when Corona hit, I moved towards uh, employment. So worked at Espresso Specialist since 2020. That's me. Yeah, you have quite the journey, but how come that you fall in love with coffee? It's a good question. I mean, the coffee, my coffee journey has been a little bit different. So I think a lot of people who work in coffee, at least now, well, when I started working in coffee, it wasn't so much that I was interested in the product. It was more something cool. It was actually latte art that got me working in coffee first. Um, but I've been drinking coffee since I was a teenager. Uh, so I used, to, I used to drink coffee at school to stay up and study. <laughs> When I first started drinking coffee, you know, I went from instant coffee to drinking pods. I bought a pod machine with a little steam wand. And so I would try to do, you know, latte art in my, in my room. And then that progressed to kind of going out to cafes with friends on weekends and things like that. At the start, it was never really the flavor. It was more the, the kind of presentation. So it's fun to work behind the machine. Um, it's really nice to see the latte art. That's how I got into coffee. It wasn't until, I think it must have been maybe four years working in coffee until I had that first cup of what was specialty coffee then, um, which really made me go into the kind of, the kind of dialing in and the flavor of the coffee. Before that, it was like, oh, cool, I can do a latte art, you know, a swan. <laughs> so... Yeah, that was, the, that was the origin. It was literally just because I thought it was a cool thing. Yeah, that sounds really nice. But uh, so you started working in the coffee industry just as a side gig doing uni, yeah? Yeah, exactly. It's very common in Australia when you work or when you, when you study at university um, to, to get a job on the side. So generally, when you're a uni student, you either get a job in a cafe or you get a job in a like in a bar and you work nights. So those are the two kind of you know side gigs that people have during university in in Melbourne. And so I started well actually 
the Melbourne coffee scene is very interesting because it's very difficult to actually be like a barista to work in any decent cafe or to get a job in any decent cafe. You need to have barista, like good barista experience to get in. So my my coffee journey started at McDonald's. Actually, I worked at a McDonald's. My job at McDonald's literally when I started was like fry chef. So I was the one, you know, deep frying the French fries, and then. In my first month of working at McDonald's, I got like the employee of the month because I was quick at making fries or whatever. Um, and so part of my like prize for that was get to choose what I did next. Um, but it's it's a it's called a cafe, so it's meant to, it's like the McDonald's cafe. So they have a espresso machine, like a traditional espresso machine, baristas who then work behind the machine. So my my start, like literally the first time I ever kind of touched an espresso machine, was at this cafe. <laughs> doing like making coffee at McDonald's so that was that was my start 10 years ago I'm very grateful for the opportunity because that was really like the start in coffee at that time I had no idea that I was going to work in coffee as a job um it was really I mean I was studying something completely different and I had like the the thought that I would go into a completely different career I really remembered like very very distinctly after a few months of working in in this McCafe my manager sat down with me um and she said you know hey look yeah you you're very good at this like cafe thing you're good with customers you're quick and you know you can make nice coffee um you should really think about taking this seriously um because you know the industry needs good people and and at the time i was like 18 i just started studying university i was like yeah like thank you that's very kind but you know i'm going to do this instead so this is just a, a side job like many years down the line, so five years. I think it was when I got when I got the job in Switzerland, which is you know a lot later. I sent her a message, my manager from that McCafe, and I and I said like, hey, look, I don't know if you remember me, but five years ago you told me that I should think about taking a job in this career, in this industry. I just want to let you know, you know, I do this as my full time job now. I live in Switzerland. That had a big impact on me, obviously that conversation. So that was the beginning. Yeah, that's really amazing going from just having a work at McDonald's and then go into the coffee in- industry full time. Uh, yeah. I understand that you started working in Paris in a coffee shop during your holiday in Europe. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's a, it's a bit of a long timeline. But as I mentioned before, I was working, I was working in a cafe on the side while I was studying. And then so during my during my time studying at university, I I worked in different cafes. So, you know, I worked at McCafe for I think it was like four months. And then I worked in an Italian restaurant with these crazy Italian bosses who would like yell at me every night because I was making the coffee wrong. Um, and then I worked at um like an Ita- like a deli. And then finally after about two years of working kind of as a barista on the side, I got a job in what you would, I guess, call a real cafe, as in somewhere where, where people actually would go to have a cup of coffee made by, you know, a professional barista. And that was after about, after two years, and I was still studying at the time. And in that job, I really started to get, re- I, I started to get really into the industry, so into the coffee kind of thing, into the cafe side. My boss, who was the owner of the cafe, was fantastic, and I really kind of looked up to him. And at the, at the same time as that, I was really not enjoying university. Um, I realized kind of that it wasn't what I was interested in. I I, I was studying maths in university. I realized, oh, this this actually isn't something for me. Like I've kind of been pushed in, not pushed, that's not the right way, but I was good at at maths in school and I was told, you know, oh, but you know, if you you study maths at university, you'll get a good job and you'll get good money and you know, you'll be rich kind of thing. So I kind of like followed that. But then after two years of studying, I, I wasn't passionate. I wasn't enjoying it. And and so I started to think, well, what, what, what if I did copy as my career? Like, what if I took a leap and did this? You know, what's the worst thing that can happen? I think that the kind of turning point, I remember it was in my third year of university. I was working at this cafe. I was kind of like a part of the team. And so I was working maybe 30 hours a week, which is quite a lot. We, we would get you know, an assignment at university and all my friends were super excited. Yeah, let's go. Like, let's go do this at the library kind of thing. And I would be like, this isn't this isn't fun. I'm gonna go work instead, and I get to make coffee kind of thing. So that was kind of a turning point for me. Um, so I decided to actually drop out of university. 
so I, I never finished my degree. So I dropped out. Like it was a lot that happened at once, but I, I dropped out of university and I went full time into this cafe. And kind of part of my part of my reasoning when I dropped out was okay. Well, I'm going to take a year away. So that's the holiday that you kind of described. So I decided to take one year away from Australia and and work in France because my mum is French and I have family who live in France. Yeah. So I, I mean, I dropped out. <laughs> I worked full time, saved up a little bit of money, and then I moved to France to do kind of a, like a year away that was how I ended up in France and then so I landed in France like six or like eight months after I dropped out so I'd been working full-time in Australia um I was managing the coffee bar so I mean when I landed in France I had a lot of experience under my belt at the coffee bar before um I was working full-time you know I had I'd been put under the like pressure of being a full-time barista kind of thing and so when I got to France and I was looking for jobs I got picked up from by a cafe called Kutum Cafe, which is and one of the founders is Australian, so that was a fun little link. That that cafe, I mean, in the ca- where I'd worked in Australia, it was not a specialty cafe. They had good coffee, but it was like a bit more Italian roast. There was not so much kind of, there wasn't so much interest in like, oh, where's the origin or anything like that. It was more like, oh, cool, I want my cappuccino. You know, here you go. Oh, there's a nice swan on the coffee. <laughs> Um, and then you go. Whereas when I got to Kutum in Paris, it was like the complete opposite. It was like, okay, here we take coffee seriously. We would have, we had a, a manual machine, like a manual espresso machine. So it was a Seneso, um, Seneso Hydra, no, Synchra, I think they're called. So it's like a paddle. So you, you, there's a paddle and you go on and off kind of thing to start yeah. and stop the shot. And um, we would have two grinders. So one grinder for the espresso and sorry for the um for the milk drink, so cappuccino latte, and one grinder for espresso, so single origin. And we would have to we would have to weigh every single shot. So, you know, you have a you have a scale in front of the in front of the grinders and you weigh, you tear, you grind, you weigh again. <laughs> and then maybe it's like eighteen point five grams and your recipe is eighteen grams. Okay, well then you get your little spoon and you put out point five grams. And then you tamp, and then we would start the shot with another scale underneath the like the cup. So say a cappuccino cup. Yeah. Um. So you start the shot, tamp it up, the shot would run, and then you would have. I mean, you would work with the recipe, right? So you have like your your dose, and then you would have the time, target time, and how much coffee you want. And if the time if the time was more than one second either side, so say your target was like twenty seven seconds. If it was twenty nine seconds, they would say, "No, nah, bin it, put it like you know, do it again," kind of thing. And I was, I mean, that that was just so different to what I'd been working with. So it was so interesting to be, to, to have that experience kind of thing in Paris and really be put through, like put to the test in a different way. Um, and it was actually there in Kutum. That was when I really started to appreciate coffee as, you know, a specialty beverage as opposed to just something you drink. That was, yeah, that's that's the story of how I got to France. So it was very a stark difference between kind of Melbourne and Paris, and especially that cafe, Kutum. Um, they were very strict, but very good. And I learned more working in Kutum about how to make coffee taste good and all the different flavors in coffee, you know, in two months than I had the four years previously working in Australia. It sounds like you had a really good teachers and a learning experience in Paris. But can you please compare the Australian coffee scene with the European coffee scene? Yeah, absolutely. The big, the big kind of differences are, or that I've experienced, and this is you know six years ago, so it might have changed. But in in Australia, especially in Melbourne and probably Sydney, but maybe in Brisbane and the other and the other cities too. Um, being, I mean, being a barista, you kind of need to work for it. You don't, you don't just go into a cafe and and just work as a barista with no experience to to work your way into like the top cafes in in those cities in Australia it takes like two or three years of work and you need to you need to be quick you need to be good you need to know how to dial in and what that means for the scene like culturally is that most cafes have really good quality coffee because the, i mean could because of the scene because of the barista, there's a lot there's also a lot of students who work So there's a lot of baristas kind of working and so that like the average kind of coffee shop <laughs> can serve a really, really nice coffee. 
Whereas I found in, in Europe, you have your specialty cafes, absolutely, where you can go and get, you know, a really nice cup of coffee. But then other places, the coffee's never really that good. It can be quite okay, <laughs> but it's not like a barista who's kind of trying to make it to one of the best cafes. It's like, you know, it's probably someone who hasn't trained to learn how to make coffee, who's just kind of been put behind an espresso machine and said, you know, here you go. <laughs> I would say that, that like the average is much higher in Australia. And also there's a lot more kind of career opportunity in Australia at for a for a you know for a brist or something. So in, in Australia there is a very kind of clear career path or different career paths you can take. So you can you start as a brista, you work your way up, you get to one of the good cafes, you get to be head barista. And then after that you become, you know, roaster's assistant, you go into the roasting or you become a salesperson for like a coffee roastery or a key account manager or a training manager or, you know, there's, there is really like a continuity in the scene. So if people choose to do coffee as a career, there is a career to be made out of it. Whereas in Europe, and I, this is something that I found in Sweden kind of especially, th there is no continuity. <laughs> it's, you, you can do your barista, you know, you work in a barista, you work in a cafe, you work your way up to one of the better ca cafes in kind of Sweden. But then after that, it's really hard to kind of break through to the next level. You can work in a big chain like Espresso House and try to work your way up. Or if you're lucky, one of the kind of roasters in Sweden is going to start looking for someone to help ro help them roast. But there's not so much continuity in the market. So what happens, unfortunately, is a lot of people, a lot of good baristas kind of leave the industry after a while because there is, there's, I mean, there's nowhere to go. So that, that, that's, I would say, is kind of the big, the big differences. One thing I will say, though, is the, the best coffee, so like the top top, I think is the same everywhere. So the best kind of coffee that you'll get in Melbourne is the same as the best coffee you'll get in Paris, is the same as the best coffee you'll get in, you know, Stockholm. Um, so I think that like the top, the, the peak, is the same kind of everywhere. It's just the average then. So in Melbourne, you know, the level everywhere else is, is much higher. Whereas in Sweden or in France, you really need to know, okay, well, I'm going to go to this cafe because I know that they have good coffee. Yeah, right. And then one difference, as, as I understand it, that in Australia, you have this really light roasted coffee almost everywhere, not just in the specialty coffee shops. Yeah, it's a bit different in Australia, though, because it's not... It's not like Nordic light. The the coffee is actually lighter in in Scandinavia. I would say. Yeah. Um. In in Australia, it's a lot of milk drinks. Um. It's kind of the same uh, as as the UK on a previous podcast. Um. Yeah. You, you know it's you know it's a lot of milk beverages. So it's a lot of latte, a lot of cappuccino, a lot of the you know world famous flat white. To to kind of make that happen, <laughs> it's a lot of blend. So a lot, you know, a lot of cafes will run a blend as their main espresso, as opposed to like a single origin, maybe a little bit lighter ro roast. It might yeah. be in Australia, the the most common kind of coffee that you'll find is like a medium blend or like a, a bit a bit darker roast blend, just because that's the culture in Australia. It's a lot of it's a lot of milk drinks and it's a lot of takeaway coffee as well. But then let's go back to Europe, and then after yeah. you was in France for a year, yeah. About a year? No, nah, not not a year. It was a. I think it was like five months or something. It, it, yeah. Okay. And very, then you moved to Switzerland. Year. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So what happened there is because originally my plan was to move to France for one year, um, and then do a year in France and go back to Australia. Um. And then so I moved to France. I was started. I started to work at Coutume. After a couple of weeks or after like a month or so, I kind of got comfortable with making the coffee that they wanted to serve. I mean, I really pushed myself. I was I was 21, living in a brand new city with no no real connections apart from my colleagues. So I spent a lot of my spare time, you know, going to the coffee roastery, exploring different cafes, really immersing myself in the culture of specialty coffee. I mean, I became quite good, um, and I became very confident in my ability to make coffee taste good and know what I was talking, know what I was doing. And then, of course, I had the experience of working in Australia, which is being quick. After, after, I think it must have been maybe four months in France, in Paris, I was approached and asked if I would 
want to go and help them open, so Kutum open a shop in Switzerland, in Geneva, with two guys down in, in Switzerland. I, of course, said yes, because that was a dream for me, uh, like a young coffee professional, just just quit university um, to do the career, and then I get this job, which is like literally head barista at this brand new cafe, which serves absolutely amazing specialty coffee. It was, I mean, it was more than I could ever imagine. And so, of course, I said yes. So I lived in, I, I worked in Paris for, for about five months between, it must have been March, March to kind of August 2016. And then I moved to Switzerland and worked in Switzerland for, yeah, like five months until, until December, until, so, until Christmas that year. So I worked in Paris for about five months. So I worked from, I think it was March to August 2016. So I worked like, it was a very short period, actually. Um, with a lot, a lot that happened in a short period of time. And then I moved to Switzerland to help open this new cafe in Switzerland until December. So that was maybe another four or five months. Yeah, and then you landed a job in Sweden. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it was a crazy. It was really, when I think back to that time, I feel like one month is the equivalent to one year. <laughs> <laughs> almost in just what well, everything happened yeah so i ended up leaving switzerland pretty quick uh a bit quicker than i expected nothing really went wrong it was just it was like a number of little little things that led to me being like okay well this is this is enough for me um and i left on good terms and everything so it wasn't like nothing disaster but it was time for me to leave and time for me to go and do something else so i left <laughs> and then I was deciding whether to go back to Australia or um or you know stay in Europe or what what am I going to do now kind of thing. and I decided to take I think I took I think I decided at the time to take a month just to travel around Europe and then the plan was to go back to Australia and so I started traveling and I was because I wanted to see Europe before I went back to Australia like I'd lived there, I'd lived in Europe for a year without really exploring so much. I was working the whole time. So I decided like, okay, well, I need to see Europe while I'm here before going back to Australia. Um, so now we're in early 2017, so January 2017. So I started traveling and like a couple weeks, I think it must have been like one week into me traveling for this one month before I go back to Australia. One of my best friends from Australia messaged me and said, hey, I'm coming to Europe for a couple months why don't we travel together? So that was kind of <laughs> perfect timing. So I said, of course, you know, of course we should travel together. I met up with my friend and we ended up backpacking together for kind of through, I think it was about two months, um, through like Spain and Italy. During that time, I started thinking, I think a bit more seriously about like, okay, I'm young. I'm not really tired to anything. Why don't I push the adventure a little bit more as opposed to just going back to Australia. I actually, I really don't know where I got this idea from, but it popped into my mind that it would be fun to live in like Scandinavia and me who'd never been to Scandinavia, didn't know any people from like any of the Scandinavian countries. And obviously coming from Australia, any country, all, first of all, all the countries in Scandinavia were pretty much the same in my head. Um, it was like a mystical land of, you know, the northern lights and midnight sun and you know a lot of snow <laughs> i decided like oh well look i'm going to try to get a job in scandinavia like it'll be fun if i don't get a job then i'll go back to australia but if i get a job you know it'll be an it'll be a fun extra year that i get to stay in in, in um in europe and you know push the adventure a little bit more so i started applying for jobs so literally I mean, I'd never, I'd never been to Scandinavia before. So all I kind of knew was, okay, well, Stockholm is the capital of Sweden and Copenhagen is the capital of Denmark and Oslo is the capital of Norway and Helsinki is the capital of Finland. And those are the kind of Scandinavian countries, right? So why don't I just apply for jobs in those cities? So I started to Google top 10 cafes in Stockholm top 10 cafes in Copenhagen, top 10 cafes in Oslo kind of thing. And I made a list and I would start just emailing these cafes, like just cold email out of the blue, like, hi, my name's Pierre, I'm a barista from Australia. <laughs> um, this is my experience, uh, you know, do you need a barista kind of thing? And I was a little bit cheeky. I would put in every email. So for example, if I was applying to Copenhagen, I would say, 
I'm moving to Copenhagen in a few weeks <laughs> and I'm looking for a booster job. And then when I applied to Stockholm, I would write like, I'm moving to Stockholm in a few weeks, you know, I'm looking for a job. Of course I... you were doing that thing because I know when I'm looking for people in my current job, if, yeah. if you're work, if you're looking for a job down in Skåne, but you live in up north in Sweden, then you really think as the manager, okay, how come they are going to apply to a job in Kristianstad when you're living right. up in Kiruna? So right. that's natural yeah. to do it, I think. Yeah, it was a little bit. It was a little bit sneaky, and it got me like, um, it ended up working in my in my favor. So when I when I first the only thing I knew about kind of Scandinavia and Scandinavian coffee culture was coffee collective. And that coffee collective was like one of the best places you could work kind of thing. This is 2017. And so I really wanted to get a job at coffee collective that I remember that very clearly. I remember like the first day to reply was coffee collective. And they were like, yeah, look, we, we can offer you a job, but it's only part time. And I'd just been traveling with my friend <laughs> um, and I really needed a full-time job. Like I, it was kind of necessary for me to work full-time. I couldn't, I couldn't hack it with part-time. And so I even like, I remember this, these kind of emails took a few days, like back and forth. So I would reply, look, I really like, I really appreciate the offer, but I really look, I'm looking for something full-time, you know, I can work different shops or I can do, I can be like a roastery assistant, like, literally anything I'll, I'll mop the floor if you need me to but as long as it's full-time work they couldn't i mean they, they like they had you know a couple of days open and that was it so, uh, so it was very you know very sad um that i didn't get the job at coffee collective and i was even looking at like can i work in a hostel or something on the side just to get some just to make it work and then i got an email from cafe Pasco in Stockholm, and this is where it was very lucky for me they i I don't know if they understood my email. Maybe I worded it wrong. But they replied to me and they said, oh, but how about you come in for an interview tomorrow and see, we need a barista kind of thing. And I was in, I was in Italy with my friends traveling still. <laughs> um, so I replied, I replied to them and I said, look, I, I, I can't come tomorrow. I'm not in Sweden yet. When do you need a barista? Like I, I can make sure that I come, you know, on this date kind of thing. And they said, oh, like early May. And this was like middle of April at the time. And so I was like, yeah, perfect. I can come in on the on the 5th of May at 10 o'clock in the morning kind of thing. And they were like, yeah, cool. Like, we'll see you then. Then I looked for flights like, oh, okay, I need to move to Sweden before the 5th of May kind of thing. So I was looking for flights and I ended up, ended up landing in Sweden on like the 4th of May at like 11 p.m. So <laughs> I like, I got off the plane at like 11 p.m. I came into Stockholm. I'd never been to Stockholm before. So I landed like in the middle of the night. I had Google Maps and I was staying in a hostel. I went to the hostel and it was like midnight when I checked in. Um, I was staying in a dorm with like eight people. <laughs> and then I woke up the next morning at eight and went to my job interview. Like the interview went really well. I really got along with them. They asked me to come back for trial during the weekend, which was the next day, so Friday the 5th of May. Um, and so it was the next day. So I went in for a trial and the trial went really well and then I ended up having a job like the next week. So it went very quickly when I moved to Sweden. That's, that's such an amazing story. Just taking yeah. it on the wing and just go for it. That's so inspiring for all of us, I think. Um, yeah, thanks. Yeah. What were your first thoughts about the Swedish coffee scene when you arrived? So I was really excited, I remember, because I... I knew that I knew of drop coffee at the time and I knew, I knew of like coffee um, and I tasted that coffee before and I thought it was, you know, fantastic. I mean, very light roast, but still well balanced and like the, the flavors and everything were, were super nice. And I was, I was really excited to be kind of in that, in that culture. And I know that Sweden or Scandinavia in general, but like Sweden and, and Denmark and, and Norway, were really, really successful in like the early days of the barista competition. And so I was really excited to be around that kind of scene, like, oh, okay, um, this is where it, it all kind of started. Like the Nordic roast is still is still internationally known, <laughs> um, you know, 20 years later. And so I was really excited to kind of move and, and experience that firsthand. 
And so I remember I took you know, a day off to go and explore like the different cafes in Stockholm. This is 2017. I remember doing like a day or two of going to different cafes. And then that was it. There was no more kind of filter cafe to find like on Google Maps. And I was like, oh, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> And so that was a bit of a, that was a bit of a shock because you think, I mean, I'd lived in Paris and Paris was such a huge city. And then before that, Melbourne, another huge city. And so I came to Stockholm, which is a capital city, but it's not, it's not as big as, you know, the, the cities I've been ex- experienced before. And I was like, oh, there's not so much actually here. <laughs> yeah, that, I, that was one of the first things. And then another thing that I noticed really early on, like, the people who worked in the coffee scene in Sweden were very passionate. So, you know, you go to drop coffee and they're super passionate about coffee and they're very good baristas. Um, and then you go to, you know, Jon and Eastrum and then you go to, I can't even remember what else there was, to be honest. And like individually, all of the places had these fantastic, passionate people, but then there was no real community. So there wasn't really like, you know, the baristas at drop didn't really know the baristas of Pascal didn't really know like the others at the time so 2017 and i noticed that pretty early i was like oh there's not there's not so much going on in the scene actually there's no big events really um or anything like that so that was one of the things i noticed really early on but i do remember obviously you know the coffee the coffee the actual physical product the coffee was fantastic you have drop coffee then you have some coffee then you have some love coffee um and i was i was in heaven like having all this coffee at my fingertips Let's go back a bit to France and let's try to compare the Swedish coffee scene or the Stockholm coffee scene with the uh, one in Paris. When I lived in France, which was 2016, I think that the scene had just begun to mature. So it was like, I mean, in France, in Paris, there was a few kind of cafes and roasteries that did specialty coffee that started a bit earlier. So maybe like 2000 and end of 2009, 2010 early 2010, so 2011, 2012. And they were like the specialty places. So Kutum was one of them. And there was a number of others as well. And when I got to the coffee scene in, in Paris, it was like the next wave was just beginning. So it was like the people who'd worked in these cafes, who'd learned about specialty coffee, they, it was their turn to start their own cafes. So I remember that there was a lot of excitement in the French coffee scene because there was a lot of new places opening all the time. Like, oh, this week we can go here. And this week we can go here and there's this new roastery over here. So I remember there was a lot of like a lot of stuff going on. I mean, now, now if I go back to Paris, there's so many new places that I've never been to before because they've opened up pretty recently. Whereas Stockholm, it feels like it never really got to that level. There was the early days of, you know, Johan and Eastrum, Drop Coffee, like the kind of pioneers in Stockholm of the specialty coffee. And maybe I'm missing some, but like the, the pioneers of, of the specialty coffee in Stockholm. But then, like, what was kind of missing was the next generation of people opening cafes. And I feel like that's starting to change now. People are starting to open specialty cafes. And if it's not necessarily staff who work in specialty, there's at least an interest in specialty. So people have the willingness to, to make that coffee. But I think that, that, was, like, that, that was one big difference that I'd noticed. So France had this kind of fantastic kind of growth and, like, burst of new places opening up which was developed by like the original the pioneers in the paris coffee scene whereas in stockholm there, there hadn't that hadn't happened yet necessarily so that was something that i that i noticed pretty pretty quickly uh, i was actually talking to Johan from gringo today uh, because yeah. i'm going to interview him next week and we were talking about okay. uh, the lack of specialty coffee shops in sweden because we have a lot of roasteries, yeah. it's over a hundred now, but we don't have as many coffee yeah. shops. So it's really hard right. to get for the everyday people just having a cup of coffee downtown. And that's the great yeah. gateway to coffee. Yeah, absolutely. To go yeah, into and that's a shame. Shop. Yeah, and that's a shame. Like there's <laughs> it's hard to op- it's hard to open a cafe in Sweden. I mean you you, you have that experience, right? Yeah, I have. <laughs> um, and then the pandemic. With, I mean, and then the pandemic, yes, yeah. <laughs> which didn't help anyone. But I think that it's a little bit more difficult because in Sweden, you know, there's a lot of the costs are so high. So, you know, the, yeah. um, 
the taxes are very high, the cost of having staff is very, very high. And so it makes it a little bit difficult to actually make a cafe kind of go around. And at the same time, the most common drink that people drink in cafes is, is brew coffee, which is not, I mean, it's specialty and you can have, of course, specialty brew coffee, but it doesn't give that, it doesn't inspire the same kind of like, wow, as getting a specialty cappuccino, for example, which is a really like, I mean, a piece of art if it's done well. And the demand for coffee isn't so much. Like in Paris, there was still a demand for coffee and still a takeaway scene. And of course, in Australia, it was, you know, we would do three kilos or four kilos of coffee just between 7 a.m. and 9 a.m. Um, just on takeaway. It's a little bit of a different scene here. Like coffee doesn't play so much of a part in the cafe as like food does, for example, which is really a big revenue driver in a cafe. In, in a cafe. But I think that what will happen now in the coffee scene, you heard it here first, <laughs> is that there's going to be, because there's so many fantastic roasters now popping up and there is this interest and willingness to actually like make specialty coffee or, you know, good coffee, that interest is going to kind of go into these cafes and people, even if they don't roast their own coffee or they don't necessarily do like the barista training, it's going to like specialty coffee is going to start to become more of a like it's going to become more prevalent in just regular cafes in Sweden and then I think what's going to be what the big question is is going to be okay well who's going to take the responsibility for education is it going to be the roasters who are educating the staff or is it going to be like independent you know people or customers or or companies that are doing coffee trainings for the for the cafes because all of the all of the like all of the ingredients there a matter of putting everything together like the right coffee specialty coffee at like a reasonable like approachable price you have willingness to invest in for example equipment then it's just a matter of marrying them together and find helping for these people make good coffee taste good yeah yeah that's the mo- most important thing to get the coffee taste really good But I remember when I was starting out with my coffee shop that I wanted to go to a barista training, but it wasn't any available. It was really, really hard to find one. At least at last I found one in Helsingborg just for during a weekend. And then I wasn't that experienced with the espresso machine because I was more of a pour over guy guy in the brew coffee. So I don't actually share your opinion about brew coffee and espresso based coffee of course you can do the latte art and that's always exciting mm. but if you have a really nice brewed coffee it tops the which milk beverage you can do yeah taste wise and i think that if you i think the important separation here is like batch brew versus pour over yeah yeah because, of course because because batch brew is the most consumed but i absolutely agree yeah. pour over is fantastic if you if you get a if you get a nice pour over it will It'll blow your socks off. It'll be fantastic. What was the best advice you got when you started in, with coffee? I don't know if I got so much advice. I kind of figured it out for myself <laughs> with the guidance of like role models. But I, I, I have advice for people who get into coffee. I'd say it's two things. If you're going to become a barista and work with coffee, learn about extraction and learn how to make coffee taste good. That skill, like that particular skill, being able to get a coffee and then dial it in and make it taste good is going to help you wherever you go. So that's step number one if you want to be a barista. Tip number two is keep your mind open. You never know what, what, like when one opportunity is going to lead to something else. I mean, for me, if I just take my own story, for example, when I left Australia, I expected to be in France for one year, not necessarily work in specialty coffee and then come back. And then I got a job in a specialty cafe and then I got to work in Switzerland. And then I got to move to Sweden and then here I am, you know, seven years after leaving Australia. And I think that if I, if I was closed, like if I said, uh, I'm not going to move to Switzerland, I'm just going to do my year in Australia, in France and then move back, then I would have never had this kind of amazing adventure. Keep your mind open and make connections and, you know, the sky's the limit. You never know where you're going to end up. So yeah, that's, that's my, my advice for the future generation. <laughs> yeah, that's really good advice. 
What would you say is the biggest difference to work with coffee in Sweden compared to the other countries that you worked in? You was a bit into it because you have higher demands as to get your foot into the door and the barista training. Yeah. But if yeah. you look more behind the bar? In the countries I'd worked in before, so France, Australia, um, there's a little bit more of like a respect around the, the role of the barista. Maybe that's changed in Sweden now. Actually, I, I think it has changed in Sweden now. Um, or it's slowly changing. But in France, for example, if you were the barista, you were the barista. You didn't leave the bar. Your job was to stand behind the espresso machine and make coffee taste good and serve the customers in a good way, like educate customers, talk to them, you know, be part of that culture. Um, and then same in Australia. Same, like if you're, you know, we would be two full-time or three full-time baristas, like working literally just behind the bar all day you know, the job of barista was literally stand behind the espresso machine and make coffee. <laughs> in Sweden, that this is starting to change. But when I first moved here, it was a little bit more like, okay, well, you're in charge of the coffee, but you're also expected to like do all of these other things that are like part of working in a cafe. That was a bit of a shock to me. I was like, you want me to do dishes? What? Like I'm the barista. Are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> and from like a barista point of view, I think that that was a big difference and I think that now it's starting to change and people respect that role a little bit more. Another thing that was it wasn't necessarily like I don't think it's a it's nothing to do with coffee but in I like in the Melbourne coffee scene or in Australia you know people are very very chatty so if you work as a barista in Melbourne or in a cafe in Melbourne chances are most people that you serve or serve coffee to will talk to you so you, you're you're literally talking all day, you know, talking to customers and stuff like that. Um, hey, how's your day going? You know, oh, how's the kids? Yeah, that literally that kind of thing. Um, yeah. Whereas in Sweden, people were a lot more reserved. And so I remember <laughs> me when I started working at Pasco, I, I carried that with me, that kind of like Australian barista culture of just talking to everyone. So I would I would be like, oh, hey, how's your day going? And people would be so shocked that I even talked to them. Not everyone, but I had experiences where I, I would ask a question and people just wouldn't reply. They were just like, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, so that was a bit funny. Or like people would just say like one or two word answers. They'd be like, oh, it's good, thanks. And then they'd pull out their phone and do something. And I think that, that like, it's got nothing to do with coffee. I, it's more of a cultural change, difference. But I think that was one of the... That was really funny for me. And and I, I really tried to continue that. I was like, look, I'm not going to just be quiet. I'm going to talk to everyone. And what I found was like a lot of people would just do the one one line answers and stuff like that. But if people used, if people would come back regularly, it would take maybe like two or three times for me to serve them coffee and be like, hi, how's your day going? Um, maybe remember their coffee order or something. And then from one day to the next, they would just open up and be like, they would be the one to me. Like, oh, hey, how are you doing today? Um, you know, like, oh, like, what, you know, where are you from? What's your story? Blah, blah, blah. And we would end up having like a nice conversation. So that was really fun. And then I actually made, when we moved, I knew no one, like literally just the colleagues that I had at my, at my job that I ended up getting at Pasco. Um, so that was a really great way for me to make friends as well. I ended up going for like beers with some of our customers and like, uh, going for coffee you know it was it was great yeah i have the same experience with the customers because i my mm -hmm. coffee shop was really really small so all the regulars uh, we got this you know strange relationship if you're a customer or a regular or are you a friend or is is this quite a mismatch or something like yeah. that so it, it's quite strange yeah I actually, I have a funny story. I remember there was there was one regular that we had at Pasco who I was really close to working in the cafe. So we, um, or when when I was working, so you know he would always come up and be like, "Oh, hey, like how are you doing today?" And we'd have a great chat and stuff like that. Like, "Oh, what are you going to do this weekend?" Like, "Oh, I'm going to go fishing," you know that kind of stuff. And then once I saw him outside of the cafe, like in a bus or something, and I went up and I was like, "Hey, man, how are you doing?" And he was like. We don't really do this in Sweden. <laughs> like go up, to talk, go up to people and talk to them. I was like, oh, sorry, that's just my uh, like, But that's, but that's so true. We up. don't do that in Sweden because you have your, you know, like your corners or your spaces. Yeah. And then, yeah, this is our coffee shop space and we are talking at the coffee shop. But this is the bar and I'm here with my friends. So don't yeah. 
woke up Don't to me. Don't come up to me kind of thing, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that was really fire. That was like, I don't know, I think I'd been in Sweden for two months or something. I was like, oh, okay, whoops. <laughs> yeah, great story. But let's go into the Stockholm Coffee Festival. Uh, sure. Because I'm really Can... cur- curious on the Stockholm Coffee Festival because I, I'm starting my own coffee event. Uh, in mm-hmm. the 22nd of October, the Swedish Specialty Coffee Camp. So tell me, yeah. please tell me a lot more about the Stockholm Coffee Festival that you are one of the founders of. That was probably the best thing that I've done in my whole career <laughs> in coffee, actually, um, just in terms of like what it did for me and also the connections I got and also just bringing the scene together. So that came about actually it kind of followed on from those those early experiences that I'd had being in the coffee scene in Stockholm. You know, I noticed like the scene is great. There's a lot of really great people in the industry, but it's quite disconnected. There's not so much, you know, there's no community feel around the community, the coffee community. It was like a lot of different kind of things that happened in a row that kind of like led to the creation of the, of the coffee festival. So the first one that happened was the AeroPress Championship in 2017, which is a drop coffee in Stockholm at their industry. And that was my first kind of like coffee event. <laughs> so that was my first competition. I think it was my first competition, um, at least like semi-serious competition. Um, and I had a good time. Super cool. Fun to get the whole community together. And it was really like, there was a lot of people that, so I left that and I was like, oh, that was fantastic. There's there's people in, interested in coffee in, in, you know, in Stockholm. It was like the first thing. And then at that time, we'd started to do some like cuppings at Pascal. So I used to like lead these cuppings where, you know, we, when we got like a new guest roaster, for example, I would do a cupping one evening. I did a couple with, um, I did some with like Daniel Rimheden from Love Coffee, um, you know, Charles from Coffee that started to grow as well so we we you know first time i did it maybe i got like three people <laughs> and then as as I did it like you know every two weeks or every month or whatever it was we started to get more people come so it was, you know three then six then ten and all, like so i started to see like well there is a community here it's just and then to the what the swedish barista championship so this is the start of 2018 but i was like completely in in love with the scene here I competed in the national championships, didn't do so well. <laughs> first national competitions or first barista competitions. Obviously, I didn't do super well. I think I got the sad from both the barista and the Brewers' Cup. I don't know how I managed that. Like, even though I, I, it was such a great event, meeting baristas from Gothenburg, from Mala, like all over the country, you know, hanging out, having such a nice time. This was in Jönköping too, which is like not even a big city. <laughs> I remember leaving that. And being like, okay, I need to do something to bring the community together. This is like, this is too good of an opportunity. I'd been thinking about the difference between, like, it, I'd been thinking about, in, like, personally, the difference between, you know, the, the Paris coffee scene and the Stockholm coffee scene. Because, like, the ground was the same in that there was, like, some pioneering coffee roasters and pioneering cafes. But how was it, why was it that Paris had such a booming scene at the time that I was there compared to Stockholm's kind of, sleepy thing and one of the reasons that i kind of realized was oh well paris they had such they had barista events all the time like they would do latte art throwdowns they would do like i can't remember what they called i think they were called like frog fights or something where they would do like all these different events that really like built the community and then and and i really believe this like and i and i this is like one of my big books about the power of community like when you connect people who are interested in the same thing together that is where like innovation happens so that is where two baristas just come up with a business idea for like a new cafe or that is where a barista who is wanting to be like a proper barista um gets up in their favorite cafe it's also where people get inspired to compete and stuff like that and so it's not like it's those kinds of events community building events that bring the coffee scene together and and innovate the scene and and push forward ultimately so i had that in my mind and i was like okay we need to do something with the coffee scene so we actually started it was me and um matt winton who was a 
he's the World Brewers Cup champion, so he's pretty famous now. <laughs> but he used to work in Stockholm, um, and he used to work at Drop. And it was me, him, and and my friend called Fabian. Um, and we started this kind of concept called The Grid. And we would do these, like, small events, like community building events in Stockholm. So we did, like, we did, like, a latte up, throw down. We would do, like, a latte, uh, coffee, uh, coffee cupping we did a event with Alexander Ruas at his roastery where we did like, you know, about roasting. And we would do like all of these like small little events, you know, just around Stockholm. And around this, at the, around the same time, so this is early 2018, we, same group of people plus a few other friends who were baristas as well. We had this group chat on Instagram and we were talking about the Aeropress Championships because it was like we were getting ads on our on our phones like, oh, host the National Aeropress Competition in your city kind of thing. Um, and we were talking about it being like, okay, hey, we need to do something. <laughs> we need to have it in Stockholm again because it was super fun the year before. And we kind of reached out to a few people like to drop coffee and said, oh, you can do it again. And they said, no, probably not this year. And we couldn't find anyone to actually host it in Stockholm. And we were like, okay, what, what do we do? And I remember one of my friends, I think, uh, I, yeah, my friend Alex, Alexander Chapman, who I ended up like starting the festival with, it was me and him at the start. He said in the, in the group chat, like, oh, we should just hire a shed <laughs> and do it ourselves kind of thing. I remember, I remember so clearly when that happened, because I was, I remember I was sitting at the bank and I was sitting there and I got that text. And then I think I had to like go and talk to the banker or whatever. So I went and did my thing and then I left and I, 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 I'm, I was like, that's it. That's absolutely what we should do. Like, what have we got to lose? Um, so, so we kind of talked about it a little bit and I had to get a little bit of support on board. So I think I talked to, I, I think I, I talked to Victor who worked at Espresso Specialist at the time. And I was like, Hey, I'm thinking of doing this event. Like, will you guys be able to support? And he's like, yep, no problem. I think I talked to Joanna from Drop Coffee and I can't remember who else. There was definitely some more who I talked to like very early on. But everyone was like, absolutely, you should do this. And to apply for the AeroPress Championships to host, you have to you have to apply. Like it's like you, you have to write an application and kind of send it in. And then they choose who, who gets to host it. I did my, you know, my cheeky <laughs> skills again. And I said like in the application, so we had nothing planned. And in the application, I was like, Hi, my name is Pierre. I'm the founder of uh, yeah. I think we were going to call it the Coffee Festival. That was a big point as well. Early discussions. We didn't want to call it the Aeropress Championship because not not everyone knows what an Aeropress Championship, but everyone can understand what a coffee festival is. So yeah. we were like, if we do if we do something called a coffee festival, we're going to get so many more people coming than if we do an championship. That was like, that was, and we were talking about like, oh, maybe we can get some sponsors and stuff like that. And so I wrote this application, like, hi, I'm Pierre, I'm the founder of the Stockholm Coffee Festival. We're going to host this festival in September. We're expecting to have like 300 people come, which was insane. No one had seen 300 people at a coffee event in Stockholm. Uh, like we're going to have, we're expecting to have 300 people. We're going to have it at this location. And I made up some random location and we really want to host the Aeropress Championship at the coffee festival. And I sent it in and I remember being like, okay, if we get if we get the Aeropress Championship, then we'll do the festival. If we don't get it, then it's okay. We can continue doing these like small events with the grid. <laughs> and so like nothing happened for like two or three weeks. So no reply. I don't even know if I got a confirmation from Aeropress being like, thanks for your, you know, thanks for submitting your application. Like nothing. And so I was kind of starting to think like, okay that's okay you know we're not going to do the coffee festival it would have been fun but they're probably giving it to someone like more qualified to host then like one morning i woke up and i checked my email and it was like congratulations you're hosting the swedish aeropress championship in 2018 <laughs> and i was like oh my god here we go um and that is literally how how it started we got that and then you have to pay this like fee to, to be able to host, I think it's like a thousand Australian dollars. So like, no, sorry, it's like a hundred, wait. No, it is like a thousand Australian dollars. So it's like 10,000 crowns. Maybe it's changed now, but at the time it was. Yeah. I was like, okay, like I'll just pay that just to host it kind of thing. <laughs> like I'd never hosted a, a you know, I barely hosted events before, let alone a, a festival. None of my friends had really hosted festivals before. I had no, no one had any background in this. So it was very like, okay, well, what do we do? 
I'm pretty sure I even Googled like how to host a, how to host a festival, how to host an event or something. We kind of figured out, okay, well, we're going to need some sponsorship. So let's get that first. We need to set a date. So let's set a date and then just work everything around the date. Let's like obviously start to plan for the AeroPress Championship. So let's start to like build some like marketing materials um, and stuff like that. And so it was me, Alex, and then we had like a, a lot of friend, help from friends as well. And we did that. I mean, we, we, we found a venue that was recent, it, that was reasonable. It was um, like Ferry Fabriken in Stockholm. They have like a small, it's called Smedjan, but it's like a shed <laughs> almost, <laughs> um, like next to, the, next to their main kind of event space. And it's like, it was much cheaper to rent and it was much smaller. We got like a, a Victor and Espresso Specialist into like provide machines have like an so bar we reached out to all the coffee or not all to, to a lot of coffee roasters that i'd known at least and i said can you sponsor you know two kilos of your favorite espresso to this coffee bar and we'll then like marketing material and then i think we got like uh we got oatly to sponsor we got i think that was uh, i can't remember but and we kind of just like piece by piece figured out like how to host this festival that was it like that was 2018 that was the first one so september 2018 i think i still have like the the booklet for it we had the aeropress championship we had like the, it was fully booked so uh, like all of the slots got filled we had like a, a espresso bar with coffee sponsored from all the roasters i think we had maybe eight different kind of coffees from different roasters on the espresso bar um, oh, that's amazing yeah it was super nice it was very nice actually and we figured out this way where we can have like pre-dosed coffees and send and put them through like a uh, like, you know, um, it wasn't an EK, it was a Matsu ZM, but it was like, no, it wasn't, it must have been an EK at the time. And like, oh, you know, if you adjust the grind size, like this coffee is going to have this grind size. So that's, I mean, that's what we did, like eight different coffees from eight different roasteries. We had a, like a roasting session with um, Alexander Ruas. There was like, uh, I can't remember. There was a few stands and I really, I, I'm so, so sorry for everyone else who, who was there who i can't remember right now but we had some like some other events as well i remember that three temp we had a brew bar so it was the same kind of thing as the espresso bar with like eight different brew coffees that you could get and then some information about it we were expecting to get 300 people and we ended up getting like 800 <laughs> so it was just like it was just the most amazing i mean i remember waking up that morning the morning of the coffee festival and i was sitting in like in my car in the car being like what if no one comes? You know, what if we get like 20 people? <laughs> and I've promised all these sponsors like 300 people and, you know, built all this hype and all of that. Yeah. And then, and then we had like, because we only had the space for one day. So we had to do the setup in the morning and then the event in like the evening or the afternoon. So I think the doors opened at one. Um, and then it, the, the festival went from like one until seven. So the morning was super stressful because me, who'd never hosted a coffee event before, I forgot to take into account water and power, like requirements to have, you know, three coffee boilers and one brewer and an espresso machine and a roast. Like, I just yeah. didn't even think of that. We got to the point where it was balanced with the help of, of like Victor and, and those guys. Kid you not, if someone plugged in their phone to charge the phone, the whole power would go out. And it was like, I was so stressful. Like we got the AeroPress Championship going. So like the competitors had started. And by the time one o'clock rolled around, I wasn't even thinking that we were meant to have, you know, a crowd or anything. And I was like, okay, well, it's one o'clock now. People aren't going to come until maybe three. So we've got another two hours to kind of set up and everything. And we opened the doors and it was packed from, from the first 10 minutes kind of thing. And yeah, it was, it was such an amazing experience. I, I'm sure that we had about 300 people just there at the start. Um, and then, you know, people came and went during the day. So that was um that was the coffee festival. That was the first year that we did it. And that was Yeah, are you absolutely. going to have a follow up soon? Because I, I know the people of Stockholm are waiting for the third one. That's the big question. <laughs> um yes, I, I mean I really want to do it. It's a matter of finding the right time. Um yeah. but I think that it's too good of a it's too good of a thing to to not have it happen kind of thing. Um and now of course, you know, I'm a lot more mature in the industry. I know a lot more. I have a lot more connections. Um, there's also, you know, our connection with the SCA so we can do stuff, you know, kind of combined. Yes is the answer. I really definitely want to do it again.
Um, just need to do it. We were actually planning one for 2020, um, and then Corona yeah. happened, so it, it didn't it didn't end up happening. But we had a really a really really good plan for 2020. So maybe we'll have to do that for you know. Next yeah, year. it's just take back that plan and start revamping it for the 2023. For the next one, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Pierre, you had quite a journey going from a job as an, a barista to being the CEO in just five years. Uh, tell us more about the journey from the, your, you know, your barista gig to the event business, and then you have your own coffee business as well. Yeah, correct. So, yeah, it's been a crazy journey. I've always been interested in business, and when when I dropped out, like way way back. When I dropped out of university to go into the coffee industry, it was always with it was always with the mentality that I will work like I will either have my own business or I'll work like in business kind of thing in the coffee business. So it was never I never expected or wanted to be like a barista for forever, and I never really you know wanted ever wanted to be like world barista champion. I was always interested in the coffee business. And, and getting into that. I mean, even when I was like young, you know, like in university still, I was reading business books um, and stuff like that. So business has been my big, like business and entrepreneurship has been my big kind of like other passion um, or yeah. interest outside of coffee. So I've always kind of had that in the back of my mind and I've always kind of, you know, either had like some side thing going on or you know it was never just like oh like I'm gonna go to work and then I'm gonna go home and chill it was always like I'm gonna go to work I'm gonna go home and I'm gonna work on like my thing whether it be the coffee festival the grid so when I moved to Sweden started the coffee festival that was kind of my first ex like experience in actually kind of having a business because that was like you know you're going after sponsors you have somewhat of like a responsibility to deliver on your promise um you, you entrepreneurial like having an idea and executing on that and so that was like that was my first kind of experience and, and like dipping my toe into entrepreneurship and i mean what a way to start it, it ended up being such a great event in the end and so after the coffee festival i got a lot of i got a lot of confidence but i also got a lot of connections um and so that kind of led to me it was like a bit of a you know a strange journey it wasn't like a to B, it was a few like hiccups in the way. But um, after the coffee festival in 2018, I ended up kind of starting my own business in um, in coffee. And what I did was I would have a kind of essentially like a coffee cart, but not like it looked nice. I would make it look nice, and I would link up with like corporate, you know, and do corporate events. So if a if a company is going to do like a breakfast, then I would be the barista at the breath, breakfast kind of thing. I remember when I started the business, <laughs> I went in and I was like, sick, this is going to be great. I'm going to sell so many events and like, be so busy. Um, and this is going to be like awesome. And I had this idea of how to find events where I would like look at upcoming events at like Stockholm's Messam or like Shista Messam. And I would look at like, okay, nice. There's going to be like the furniture fair. And so I would get a list of all of the like exhibitors at the furniture fair and I would literally call them like work my way down you know old school kind of sales call them and be and say you know hi my name is Pierre I'm from the grid which is what we called at the time um we're a coffee catering company you know do you want a barista at your like at their event I see that you're going to be at the thing and they're like oh maybe or like no we're not interested or you know like whatever and for like a month I was calling every day trying to find events and I got zero events from it, like not one. That was fun. That was the introduction to being an entrepreneur or self-employed. So that was really tough, you know. After one month, I'd like quit. I'd quit working as a barista, so I stopped working at Pascal, and I was like, I'm gonna go into business for myself. Like, you know, the grand gesture of like doing this. A friend of mine was gonna host a kind of a wine event, and said like, Look, why don't you just come and make coffee? Like, we can't pay you, but if you come, it's just fun, um, and you get to do something instead of like be sad in your office because you're not getting it. I ended up doing that event. And from that from that event, which was not even meant to be like anything serious, I got two events paid. And then I kind of realized the more events I do, the more I can, the more events I can sell. 
I think that was such a great lesson, like trying to figure it out for myself, like this business thing, how how much do I charge? All of like what what is reasonable to offer, what's reasonable to ask, like all of these things. And so that was my first experience in business for real. Um, and it ended up going quite well. So in that first year, so 2018, 2019, sorry, um, we ended up getting some really cool events. Like we got the Lollapalooza, you know, like the big music festival in Stockholm. Yeah, I know um, about it. Yeah, we ended up having a, a stand there. Like it was like all these big companies with all of their stuff and then the grid in this little <laughs> tent <laughs> serving coffee. Um, so that was cool. I mean, that was a really cool experience just to get that. And then, and then a lot more corporate stuff, some big like festivals, and then ended up getting asked to be like, to have this kind of coffee. I called it coffee catering was the yeah. concept. I ended up being asked by a, kind of a friend or a connection to be the barista for, do you remember the Aviti concert? Like the tribute concert that happened yeah. in 2019? He was like, yeah, you know, I'm going to be part of the music team. Do you want to come and like make us coffee? And like, you know, we can do this coffee catering thing. You can, if you can bring some coffee and, and, and serve us and stuff like that, that'd be great. I was like, yeah, absolutely. And that was probably the craziest event that I've ever, that I actually ever did. It was like, it was two days, you know, in the practice room with all the band and also like the artists. And then at the arena, I was literally like literally backstage. So it was like the dressing rooms with all the artists, like David Guetta, Nicky Romero, like all of these huge artists and then me serving coffee. Uh, that was, that was unreal. And like a bunch of other events, but, you know, I really ramped up, up like the, the events. Um, and so that was really cool, you know, uh, like handling a growing company, um, something that I built kind of myself, you know? So then we did the second version of the Stockholm coffee festival. So a little bit more professional and we knew what we were doing. And we ended up having like 1,100. So we broke the thousand people that came that day. And so I took a holiday at the end of 2019 and went back to Australia to relax and see family and friends and things like that. I came back and I was renting space from a special specialist. And so that was like the connection that I'd had. Like they'd always, they'd always supported me with the coffee festival. And, you know, it was a natural like evolution that I would rent space and just be kind of there. I was at a special specialist in working. I had my desk in my area and then Corona hit and that was crazy. <laughs> I was on track. I was on track to having, you know, my best month for the business, for the, the coffee catering business. We were like getting stuff ready for the coffee festival. And there was a lot of, you know, momentum getting ready for 2020. And then within a day, everything stopped. I had, I was, I was booked for like, this was at like the middle of March. I was booked until the end of April. And then I had bookings for like, you know, May, June. And so I was getting ready for like the busiest period that I've ever experienced. The day that the, you know, the pandemic was called a pandemic. Yeah. I think it was like the 16th of March or something. It, the whole day was literally just my phone ringing being like, yeah, look, sorry, we're going to cancel the event. We can't, we can't have it. That was really tough. Every, every single event that I had booked apart from one, which was in June, cancelled <laughs> and the one in june was like oh it's going to be in standby we'll we'll let you know like we'll see how this develops you know so that was pretty crazy i remember coming home lying on my bed just being like what has happened i've yeah i i mean everything has just gone up in flames and instead of being super motivated to you know go out and do these events it was like how how am i going to live like what am i going to do now so it was tough and then i ended up very, very gratefully worked, like getting some shifts at Pascal. So obviously my old employer who I've stayed in fantastic contact with, they could squeeze me in, you know, here and there and give me shifts. So I had something to do. And the rest of the time I was like, I was, I think I was doing like an online course or something like an barista, online barista course. And I was coming up with the program, um, just trying to figure out like, what's the next step. At the time there was a new kind of like head of, op like, vice CEO or like the person in charge of espresso specialist in Sweden um, called Ville, who was same age as me, very business background, like sales and business, but he didn't have so much idea about coffee 
or it didn't come from the coffee world. And so we were talking one day in the office and I pitched the idea like, well, look, why don't I just shadow you? I don't need to get paid. This is just education for me. Like do an internship. <laughs> um, yeah. I'll follow you around for a couple of days a week. You can teach me about how you do business and sales and I'll teach you about coffee. And so we did that for like a month and it went really well. And at that point, we also realized that it wasn't going to be a couple months. It was going to be a long kind of a long thing. And so he kind of said like, you know, yeah, there's, if you want it, it's in the warehouse, like packing boxes, but you'll have a job. So I was like, yeah, cool. Awesome. And so that's how I started working at Espresso Special System from that, just trying to make the best of like a crazy situation for everyone. And then, so that internship turned into a part-time job as I continued to work. So obviously I, I worked in the warehouse. I was, you know, packing boxes and stuff like that to, to Villa, who was, you know, the boss to his credit, he kind of kept me involved in like the business side as well. So he would bring me into big meetings and stuff like that. And so I really had an idea of like, okay, I understand what's going on in the business. And also I have something to contribute because I understand coffee. He, he ended up having some, some health problems. He had to take some time off first, which was when I went full time because I had obviously been involved in all of the meetings and everything. Um, and he said like, look, you know, you know what's going on. Just make sure that like, things continue but he, he ended up deciding to leave the company he recommended to take over that was it so i in 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 february i became head of operations so yep. i was like running the company but i didn't have any like responsibility in that way uh, it was like business running the business side of things yeah 2021 was a crazy year for everyone <laughs> yeah i mean that like that year i it was like I learned a lot about business, but I also managed to, I think, do quite well in the business and managed to navigate a pretty interesting time in the company, managed to navigate it quite well and ended up being, you know, like, we, we ended up doing, I mean, we ended up doing okay, um, doing better than anyone expected. And that was kind of a moment where I think the owner who owns a similar company in New York saw like, okay, well, I can, I can trust this guy. He knows what he's doing. I'm going to like give him the full responsibility. And I was really hungry for it. I, I'm pretty sure like one of the first meetings I had with the boss is like, I want to become, you know, CEO, like I want to run the company um, like really early, which is a, a bit of a risk. It's, it's a bit arrogant to say. I also like stating your intention early, like, because if it doesn't work, it, it's better for it to not work quickly so that I can do something else than hope that I might get a promotion. Like I, I want to state when I go into a place, like this is what I'm aiming for. And then we can work together to get there. And then that's what happened. So that's how I became CEO. So I took over as CEO in, um, in like April. Uh, was it April? Yeah, April this year. So I've been, I've been running the company since. So how is it to be the CEO from the head of operations? What's the difference? Day to day, not much. You have a little bit more like like responsibility. You have a lot more. Uh, actually, my job, my actual job, like what I would do during the days, not so much. It was more of a, like a title change. Um, yeah. And you have a little bit more. I mean, you have a little bit more responsibility power as well to like call companies and say, I'm the CEO <laughs> as opposed yeah. to I'm the head of operations. Like it, it, it is, it was just a, it was a title change essentially. You were actually completing in a Swedish Barista Cup this year because yeah. the um, was so close for not having the competition because they were missing one competitive. Yeah. yeah. And, and on the stage you told everyone, yeah, you did it for the love of coffee or, or for the love of the Swedish coffee scene. Uh, can you evolve that some more? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So that was a very fun, that was a really funny kind of experience. So what happened was, because it was in Malmö, you know, the event. Yeah. And to Malmö for that event. Like I, I, I was kind of planning the trip kind of thing. And so I think it, it must have been like two weeks or three weeks before the competition. I remember calling Philip and being like, hey, is this competition going to happen? Like, I need to know so I can book my ticket. And he was like, yeah, we need one more person. Like, if no one else signs up, then we have to cancel it. And I was like, look, don't cancel it. 
I'm going to be there anywhere. Anyway, if no one else signs up, I'm happy to just jump on stage and make a couple of espressos. That, you know, you don't, need to, you don't cancel it. You know, I'll, I'll jump in and do like a rent. And then, <laughs> and then like a couple of days later, I had some friends like messaging me on Instagram being like, are you going to compete in the Barista Championship? And it's because Philip had posted that I was going to be one of the competitors, uh, <laughs> <laughs> which is very cheeky. Yeah, and, and so he was like, you know, and I was like, okay, fine, like, I don't mind. I guess I'll just, I'll, I'll just, I guess I'll just jump, like, jump on, jump up, jump up on stage and, and have this competition. I didn't really plan anything. Like, I hadn't, I hadn't had, I didn't have a presentation planned or anything. Um, and I was quite busy. I remember it was a really busy time, excuse me, it was a really busy time in, like, for work. So I was, I was really busy. I was, I think I was in Gothenburg the week before. And I had like zero time to prepare, like zero. And I was thinking, I, I think I started to think about like, okay, well, what, what am I going to say? Like, what's my presentation going to be about? So at least I don't go up on stage and just be like completely silent. <laughs> so when I got to MoMA, I kind of had an idea of like, okay, well, this is like what I think I'm going to say. I'll also preface this by saying like, I've been around competitions. So I've been to the world champion, not as a competitor, but I've been to the world championships with Matt when he competed for Sweden twice. So 2018 and 2019, like we were on the same team. I've been around like these world champions, literally. Um, and, I, yeah. and I've seen like the presentation and how they approach competition and all of that. It's not like I was going in blind. Like I, I knew what was needed for like a successful presentation kind of thing. But I had no coffee. I mean, I didn't have any coffee. I didn't have any like time to prepare or anything. Um, but I did know like, okay, well, I know that if I... You know, if you look at the score sheet, you have these points for saying this, these points for saying this. And you can kind of like, you can you can actually kind of hack the competitions a little bit. Yeah, because you get double points on some things, yeah? Yeah, or you get more points, like some things are weighted more than others. So like, yeah. for example, the espresso, if you have a good espresso, then you get scored really high. But if your espresso isn't good, then even if everything else is perfect, it's hard for you to do well. Yeah. And so if you look at the score sheet, you can kind of see like, okay, well, where can I pick up points and where can I pick up like easy points? So I got to MoMA. It was a Friday. I think it was practice on Friday and competition on Saturday. Yeah, was it, it was. Practice? It was that, yeah? Yeah. And so I think I, I, got, to go, I got to MoMA on Thursday night. <laughs> I had my practice time first. So I was the first one to have my practice time the next morning. And I went to Philip and I said, look, Philip, do you have any coffee I can compete with? <laughs> you, you, you got me into this, so you can help me out with some coffee. And he was very, very kind and gave me um, a really nice, like single origin Kenyan, I think it was a washed Kenyan. Really nice coffee, um, quite high acidity, but you can score pretty well with high acidity. I dialed it in very quickly. And I remember you only have one hour to practice, so you don't have so much time. And this was the first time I had literally held like, even tasted the coffee I was going to serve. And I remember I couldn't figure out how to make the grinder work. So it took me like 15 minutes to, to actually figure out how to make the grinder work. So that was like, okay, nice. You know, 15 minutes later, and I'm pulling my first shot of espresso. And because it was like a new, like a new grinder, you know, out of the box or, or whatever, yeah. it hadn't been dialed in properly. So I think my first shot was like 13 seconds or like 12 seconds. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> like dialed it in, made my coffee. I was trying to like not stress too much i was like okay i need to make the coffee taste balanced i need to make a milk drink and i need to get my flavor notes if i have that then i can figure the rest out that's what i did like i, I dialed in i asked i think arlo was one of the sponsors so i went up to the arlo rep like and i was like hey do you have any milk i can use for my for my competition and they gave me a couple cartons and then yeah like the next day i mean and not to i mean training for competition and especially doing your first competition it is tough like it is it's something new and it's not like working behind a, a bar or a cafe um you really like it, it is a bit different and all of the people who competed in the swedish brewster championship did this year everyone had worked so hard to like practice and dial in and everything like that so i really i really really respect that and like i don't want to discredit their hard work because absolutely like you know, they absolutely deserve to be in the championship and, and compete. But I was also, I had the background of being involved in the competitions before and seeing like 
the world competitors, like what they do. So it was easy for me. Easy is not the right word, but it was a natural process for me to like kind of copy what happens on the world stage and just see what I can do in the like little time that I had to compete. And then, yeah, during the competition, everything kind of came out like without a hitch. The speech, I, I mean, I, I wrote the speech the day before, like in my hotel room, you know, I ended up coming third, which was absolutely not expected. And as you mentioned, you know, I said in my presentation, my whole presentation was about like the importance of competitions in Sweden or in, in a national, you know, in a national competition. It's so important for these competitions to happen so that people who are, people who are just getting into the industry have people to look up to um, and something to strive for. So it's hard. It's, it's a hard industry to be in, the coffee industry, especially in Sweden. In, in the way that it is now, in that there's not so many opportunities. But one way you can make opportunities for yourself is to compete. Um, and if there's no competitions or no one to look up to, then there's nothing to, com you know, there's nothing to strive for. So I really, really was super kind of passionate about, like, look, we're going to have these competitions. We, I don't mind getting up and embarrassing myself. Um, but as long as we have a winner, for Swedish baristas to look up to and kind of like push the scene again, then that, that's, you know, that's, that's what I wanted. And so that's kind of what I spoke about in my presentation. What advice would you give someone who are just want to get into the competition scene? Yeah. So my biggest advice for beginner competitors is, is don't overcomplicate it. I think that people look at competition and they get kind of scared by how complicated or difficult it could be. Um, and, you know, they're watching like world championships and trying to make the same kind of presentation as the world championships. Don't. <laughs> Your first competition is about making connections and just getting confident to go up on stage. And you'll learn so much in that first year that you compete that you, like, you'll learn so much from competing that first year that then you can have a decent crack the next year just from the knowledge and the connections that you make from that first year. So the first year is so, it's so important that you don't overcomplicate it. Find a coffee that excites you. Make, it's three rounds. It's an espresso round, a cappuccino or a milk round um, and a signature drink. That's it. It's not that hard. You're making four espressos, four milks, cappuccinos, four signature drinks. Don't overcomplicate it. it. It's so easy to get so like worried about, oh, you know, I need to do this and this and this. You know, it's fine. I went up on stage. I was borrowing. I was. I borrowed water cups. Um, I think I borrowed espresso cups. I had coffee, like a very, very nice coffee that I just kind of got. Um, and I made cappuccinos, like normal cappuccinos that you know you would serve in a normal cafe. My my signature drink was espresso and orange juice. Maybe don't go that <laughs> basic. That was actually um, the biggest laugh. Yeah. On all the day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, actually, I, I can quickly explain the logic behind that. So I don't know if you remember, but at that time, there was like this trend going on, on like Instagram, TikTok that was like, try espresso and orange juice. It's like really like, you know, it's better than you think. And I was like, perfect. This is going to be great. I can take, I can, because obviously when you, when you serve a uh, similar to drink or any drink during the competitions, you have to say the flavor notes. And I was like, perfect. I'm going to take orange juice and espresso. And my flavor notes are going to be orange juice, orange peel, and then like whatever the flavor in the espresso is, which was like cherry. Yeah. Done. <laughs> I don't have to do any more <laughs> than that. I mean, don't go as basic as that because that was like, I kind of got away with it, but I wouldn't recommend others. But don't overcomplicate it either. It's very easy to watch a barista championship, like a world barista championship where they're doing these crazy infusions and, and you know, crazy stuff. You don't need to go to that level. Not not in the nationals. Not in your first competition. Just find find a good coffee that you're interested in and excited about. Be very clear in what the flavors are, and make sure that you can actually taste those flavors. And then for the signature drink, just find flavors that match like match that flavor profile. So if you have like you know if it's like a fruity coffee, then find fruity ingredients to build it up and make it like a bit summery maybe. Or if it's like a very you know intense sweet coffee then maybe you want to mix it with something a bit more heavy to bring out like the sweetness or whatever you know but don't yeah. don't overcomplicate it that's my biggest advice yeah that's a good piece of advice uh, because i think people overthink it think it because they make yeah. it this big thing 
but actually you're just doing some coffee for four people. I remember exactly. when exactly. you know when when I opened my coffee shop and and then I people that uh, was really coffee professionals came in and people that yeah. maybe I looked up to, and then yeah. you started to make coffee for them. It was so yeah. nervous at and first. Like, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 very, and I mean, it's like that when you're on stage. So it's, it's kind of good practice, but yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, I think. Uh, like when you start to sell like con professionals, you know, people that you look up to and stuff like that. Like, I think that they don't really care. Like, uh, obviously they want to get like a nice coffee and stuff, but they're not going to, they're not going to judge the coffee that you give. I mean, they're not, or at least most coffee professionals, like they're going to be like, oh yeah, it, it's really nice. Thanks. Kind of thing. Um, yeah. I, I actually remember. So when I, when I was starting in coffee, one of my big um, like inspirations was was Matt Matt Perger, who's a Melbourne like he runs Barista Hustle now. He had this blog called Barista Hustle, um, yeah, I and I when I started in when I started in coffee like I it was a bit different before. It wasn't like a subscription education thing. It was literally just a blog with all these blog yeah. posts. And I would I was reading like all of these blog posts and stuff, and I was like I, I was I mean I learned a lot about how to make coffee from from that blog especially in the early days. And so I really like, I was like, oh, Matt Pergo, like such a sick barista kind of thing. And then when I was living in Switzerland, so in Geneva, he came into my cafe, like into the cafe I worked in. And it, it wasn't even like he just rocked up. He posted, it was such a weird experience. Like, I mean, Geneva isn't really a country that you, or a city that you just kind of go to. Like, it's not, it's not like Paris, you know, where you could have, like, it's reasonable to think that friends would go there on holidays. Yeah. Geneva is such a weird city. You don't get that. And I saw one day on Twitter, and I never really used Twitter, but I saw on Twitter that he posted that he was in Geneva. And I so I messaged him. I was like, oh, but come by this cafe. Like, I'll serve you a coffee kind of thing. And he replied, and I was like, cool, I'll be there in 20 minutes. And I remember being like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm so nervous right now. This is going to be like, and I remember my bosses were there, and they were like, yeah, what is going on? You know, you, like, you're crazy right now. I was like, oh, yeah, like, oh, this guy is coming in. And I kind of explained to them who they were. And he was like, they were like, who, you know, uh, which is the funny thing about coffee, right? Like, they, like famous people in coffee aren't really famous, you know, like it. Except it's James maybe Hoffman. Like, exactly. I was just about to say, apart from James Hoffman, <laughs> like I, I was so nervous. Like I remember, I remember there was a customer who came in who kind of looked like Matt and I was like, oh, hey, Matt, how are you going? And then my bosses were like, no, that's not, that's not him. That's some, like, that's this regular who comes in. And I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, and then finally, finally, I'll never forget this. Like Matt walked in, and I was like, "Okay, this is actually Matt. This is him." And he's like, "King," and like, "Oh, but like, I'll just have an espresso." I was like, "Yeah, cool, espresso." In the coffee before he came in, so I was like fine tuning the grinder. I put the filter in the grinder, and the top, like the grind adjuster disc, just went. I forgot to lock the grinder. Um. <laughs> And I was like, oh, my God. So then the next shot that I pulled was like 10 seconds. And I was like, oh, <laughs> brutal. And so I was like, look, Matt, I'm really sorry, but I forgot to like lock the coffee out. It's going to take me, it's going to take me like 10 minutes. And he's like, yeah, no stress. You know, and he just sat and talked to the bosses. And it was really chill. You know, when you have, I totally sympathize or empathize with you when you, when you have people that you're, you look up to in the coffee industry who come and you're maybe a little bit newer in the industry. You really want to impress them. Most of us remember when we had this, you know, the first cup of coffee that made made us go, "Wow, can the coffee taste like yeah. this?" Uh, can yeah. you please share some of your coffee stories? Absolutely. So the first the first time that I had a coffee like that was actually when I moved to France, um, which is which is kind of crazy because I'd lived in Melbourne, which is a coffee mecca for many years. Um, and I'd worked in coffee for like three, three, four years at that time. And I'd had good coffees. Obviously, I, I'd had like coffees that were like, mm, this is really nice. I like this. But I remember the first, the first coffee where I was absolutely blown away was at Kutum. It was this Ethiopian Guji washed. And it was so fruity and sweet. And I remember tasting it being like, oh my God, this is the best thing I've ever tasted. Like, this is so good. How, how can, is this even coffee kind of thing? It's hard because once you, once you have a few of those, 
absolutely amazing. Every time you want to, every time, I think it's especially when you make your own coffee, you're always trying to taste that. And that you make yourself is never as good as the coffee that you get served. And I think that's a mental thing, but. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the best thing with not running a coffee shop is that I can go to coffee shops now and drink coffee that some other right. people make for me. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. Actually the best and it's thing. so much better. <laughs> yeah. I think it's it's hard because when you make your own coffee, you're so critical about about everything because you've obviously yeah. thought about how am I going to make it and like the, the like the grand size and how long it's going to run. And so when you taste it, it becomes less. It's a little bit less about enjoyment and more about like, oh, did I make it good? Whereas if you go to a cafe and you ask and you order something, you're not thinking about that. You just want to enjoy a good coffee. Yeah, um, you just want want yeah. a cup of coffee and sit down and relax with maybe with some friends and just have a great time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, when it comes to coffee, who are your inspirations? Well, Matt Perger originally, definitely. Kind of like learned so much from him. I really like it when people go far in coffee, if that makes sense. So, for example, like Matt Winton, who's my friend, who just became the World Brewers Cup Championship champion. I remember talking to him a few, like a few years ago. You know, be- be- when he was starting to compete, and he's like, "Yeah, I really want to be world champion and all this." And now he is, and I think that that's so unbelievable i mean I, i'm so happy for him but it's like wow like he, he actually did it you know like that's really cool and like you know people like james hoffman he's taken coffee which is a niche and he's made it mainstream i mean he yeah. nearly has a million followers on it on on youtube sorry that's yeah, um amazing. that's insane and he's he's making the coffee more accessible to everyone i mean like think of how many people get drawn into coffee by, because they watched a video from James Hoffman. It must be a huge kind of number. Yeah. Um, same with, there's a, there's a Morgan Drinks Coffee on Instagram. Yeah. Do you follow? Do yeah. You follow Actually, she got the YouTube channel as well, so I picked her yeah. up on YouTube. Oh, yeah. Perfect. Yeah, I mean, 800,000 followers or something. Crazy. Yeah. Like, it, it's... And, and when you get to that level, it's less about the, the niche, and it's more about the mainstream. And that's so that's so cool. <laughs> it's gonna sound it sounds really corny, but like everyone, like you know, like Joanna Alm from Drop Coffee, she is a fantastic roaster, and she really loves coffee, and she's made a career out of it. The guys at Copy, you, <laughs> like everyone, everyone who who takes like takes the passion and makes it into something, I think is so so cool. And everyone has yeah. a different part too. What do you think is in the future for you, Pierre? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, very hard to say. I've never been able to successfully predict my my future. When I when I when I was studying, I never thought I'd get into coffee. When I got into coffee, I never thought I would be make it. You know, a career. Uh, when I moved to France, I thought that I would stay there for one year, not seven. <laughs> when I moved to Switzerland, I thought that I would be there for forever or like for many years, and I was there for five months. When I moved to Sweden, I planned to be here for a year. You know, when I started the when I started my events company, I thought I'd be doing that forever. So, I have never actually been able to predict what I'm going to do, <laughs> and I'm totally okay with that. I would say where I'm at now with with Espresso Specialist and my job is a very very nice mix of two things that I'm genuinely interested about. I'm t- I'm genuinely interested about coffee, and I love being in the coffee industry, and I'm genuinely inter- interested about business, and I love like the entrepreneurial business thinking of like running a company. And so that's a really nice mix. So I really, really enjoy that. And I can influence a lot of people who are starting in their coffee journey through that role. I mean, like people who are starting cafes and stuff like that. I want to be involved in the community. And I think there's a lot that can be done to grow the community in Sweden. But after that, we'll see. I'm very open. I'm keeping my mind open. I'm I'm taking some of my own advice. Yeah, on that note, how many business ideas do you have in your in the top of your head right now? <laughs> yeah, I have a list on my phone of like business ideas. Yeah. Um, there's actually there's like three things right now that I'm like, oh, this is something that I could do. Like, yeah. or there's there's two things outside of the special special system that I'm like, oh, this this is stuff that I could work on like on the side kind of thing. Yeah. Um, it's always coming new things. I don't know. It's um, it's 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 to a point where I'm like, you know, it, it's a matter of choosing where I put my time um, and like work. 
my, my actual work that pays my bills is very time consuming and it takes a lot of work. It's, it, it is a lot of work and I enjoy that work. So it's fine. I'm happy to work a lot. And so with the rest of the time that I have, I need to be smart with what I do. So we'll see. I'm, I have, I have some ideas, so we'll see what, what they end up um, leading to. <laughs> Uh, if you have to choose just one coffee that you will drink every day for the rest of your life, what kind of coffee would that be? Oh, a washed Ethiopian, like a washed Ethiopian Guji. Then I'm in heaven. That's the top one. That's the one. I would say actually, if it's filter coffee, if it's like pour over. If it's espresso, then Guatemala. I think Guatemala is so underrated as a as a producing country, especially in yeah. especially in espresso. The best espressos I've ever had have been from Guatemala. I like Guatemalan coffee. So. Uh, how can people get in touch with you if they are just w- want to speak about coffee or just to have a chat? Instagram is the best. It's there yeah. on the on the screen. Um, so at yeah, barista fair. And I. I'm always keen to meet new people. So, you know, whoever's listening, please reach out and let's have a coffee together. I really love new people. Yeah. Uh, I really enjoyed our chat together about coffee and life in general. It was really nice. Yeah, it's been super fun. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for joining us. Det där var intervju med Pierre Tims. Tyvärr så hade han lite dålig uppkoppling men sånt händer ibland. Jag hoppas att ljudet har varit bra under hela intervjuen. Eh, glöm inte att gilla videon, prenumerera på kanalen och kommentera om du har någonting att kommentera där nere. Så hörs vi. Hej!